So while we have our eyes fixed on the budget, the budget, the budget, all this other money is coming in as non-budgeted. And that's getting shunted off into slush funds and investment funds of all sorts and kinds. We're just kept in the dark like mushrooms about the actual factual finances and accounting of this entire country. And for the last several decades, the International Monetary Fund has functioned as the U.S. Treasury. So when you get something from the U.S. Treasury, what you're getting is a dun from the International Monetary Fund. You don't know who you're addressing or who's addressing you at any given time. So this confusion is then promoted to basically promote fraud. Uh, it's actually been going on since the Civil War, so you've got a 150-year history of fraud. And some of the fraud goes back even further. Some of it goes all the way back to the pounding. If your digestion is off and your metabolism is slow, it could be due to gluten. According to Harvard MD Dr. Alessio Fasano, we are able to completely digest every protein we put into our mouths with the exception of one, and that's gluten. Gluten is everywhere, almost all restaurant foods, salad dressing, soy sauce, and many, many more. Due to gluten, people are suffering from symptoms including joint pain, headaches, skin issues, digestive problems, weight gain, brain fog, and lowered immunity. Most people suffer from at least three of these. Also, people are getting gluten contamination on a daily basis. Some have more tolerance and experience less symptoms, while others are more sensitive and their health degrades faster. The good news is that there is an enzyme complex which specifically breaks down gluten, DDP4. Learn more about this amazing enzyme and be able to eat the foods you want and get back to a healthier you. Click the link below. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. I have a really interesting guest today. Her name is Anna Von Wright. They have been researching the history of this country and actually the world for over three decades. And she plays the role of a judge and she plays the role of an educator, all sorts of things that they're doing. They have figured out how our country has been manipulated into being controlled by the crown and the Vatican, the Pope. And that happened at the time of our civil war and what that means to us and how we have been recast into a losing our freedoms. And she will explain all that and what that means. I, I got to profess, I don't completely understand, but I'm very interested when a group of people who are smart and caring come forward and are trying to fix something and have facts that they can point to that, that can make sense. And so she's coming and presenting all this stuff to us and giving us ways that we can learn at a child's level what she's talking about and also from a business perspective what she's talking about. It, you know, people hear about the gold flags in the courtroom and how that means that they're not on our jurisdiction. There's all sorts of things here and she's she's a really interesting character and she stays after for my patrons and we talk about the history of all this when it started from Sumeria to Rome to present day and it ties into different religions. It has to be one of the most interesting conversations I've ever had and that's for my patrons. I, I just wasn't expecting it to become that interesting but man it was. So if you are, are a patron of mine please go there. But I also want to remind you that there are some free summits going on right now, and I have the links below for those. They're free. It's great information, so be sure to check that out. Let's get into my interview with Anna Von Wrights. Hi, Anna. Welcome to the program. Hello, Sarah. Pleased the, to be here. I'm really glad that you came. I really wanted to talk to you. I've talked to other people who have sort of the same ideas and things that you do, but you're different. Everybody has their different, you know, way that they explain it. But yours is is um, quite a bit different. And, and as far as what you're trying to do right now, can you explain why it's important that Trump or others in power understand what it is that you're trying to to do? Well, basically, I hold the key to their problems. But they don't realize that. 
they think that it is a matter of dealing with other international parties or with banks or trustees and blah, blah, blah. And the people they really need to be dealing with are the American states and people. And that requires talking to us because the United States of America, the holding company, um, is the repository of the assets and credits that they need to get back on the board and be operating properly. They don't control that. We do. How did that happen? How did they get to a point where they don't control the assets? Well, basically, the the big schism came in 1946 when the Territorial United States Congress and the Municipal Congress adopted a new system of accounting. Now, this new system of accounting is called double accrual, and it was developed by Fast Eddie O'Hara, who was Al Capone's bookkeeper and uh, used back in the day. The IRS discovered this and the FBI, and uh, you know, 20 years later, it was adopted as the bookkeeping system by the general by the government accounting office, the GAO. So since 1946, we've been using this uh, very funky, duplicitous accounting system. And in this system, you have a credit ledger and a uh, debit ledger. And basically, the credit ledger was left to the United States of America unincorporated, and the debt ledger was left to the United States and to the um, territorial government. So, in essence, what's happened is that Donald Trump has inherited the debt ledger, and we've got the credit ledger, but never the two shall make, meet. Do you see what I mean? How do you know this? What did you, where did you find, or how could somebody look at that and go, yeah, that's what I see too? I mean, how <laughs> do you look into, you know what I'm saying? Well, um, you can begin by looking up Fast Eddie O'Hara, who was uh, the father of the uh, aviator hero that O'Hara National Airport is named after. And you can look up double accrual accounting, and you can look at the government accounting office records and see that that form of accounting was um, adopted. Uh, and then you can begin to understand how this dual accounting system works where, well, for example, uh, they have all of these streams of income coming in. They set aside some of it as a budgeted amount, and then they leave all the rest of it coming into a non-budgeted account. Okay? So while we have our eyes fixed on the budget, the budget, the budget, all this other money is coming in as non-budgeted, and that's getting shunted off into slush funds and investment funds of all sorts and kinds. You may have heard about uh, the comprehensive annual financial reports. This is one tip of the iceberg where uh, Walter Buren uh, researched all of that and discovered that every year uh, there is a report made that shows kind of a listing of all the accounts. You have to dig into it, but then you realize, oh my gosh, there's gazillions of dollars out there that's been squirreled away in all sorts of different accounts and funds that never see the light of day, are never taken into consideration as part of the wealth the debt or the credit, and we're just kept in the dark like mushrooms about the actual factual finances and accounting of this entire country. Well, who's whoever's doing it knows, I would assume. Sure. So who, who are they that are doing this? Well, you've got the tip top of the government accounting office for sure, and you've got the treasury for sure. Now, another point that most Americans are oblivious of, we haven't had a treasury in this country since 1924. That would shock most people to death, but that's the fact. 
and for the last several decades, the International Monetary Fund has functioned as the U.S. Treasury. So when you get something from the U.S. Treasury, what you're getting is a done from the International Monetary Fund. And there are all sorts of different names for different things uh, that are very confusing. You've got the U.S. Department of the Treasury. You've got the Department of the Treasury. You've got the Department of the United States Treasury. I mean, they've thought up all these different names so that unless you're really sharp and looking and know what you're looking at, you don't know who you're addressing or who's addressing you at any given time. So this confusion is then promoted to basically promote fraud. Well, it sounds like fraud, but how how can a, a person, Trump or anybody else, dig into it and understand it? What would you suggest somebody does to actually be able to look at this and go, okay, I, I'm starting to get the picture here? Well, we've written three books. Uh, they're available on Amazon under my name, Anna Maria Reisinger, or Anna Von Reitz, either way. My name is kind of confusing because it's long and because I took a pen name about 30 years ago, Anna Von Reitz, which is a, it's a shortened version of my actual family name, Von Reitzenstein. And um, so anyway, you can get the basics there. Uh, there are a lot of references and citations that are given. We're in the process of issuing a timeline that is a pretty shorthand way of looking at how all of this got set up and structured. Uh, it's actually been going on since the Civil War, so you've got a 150-year history of fraud. And some of the fraud goes back even further. Some of it goes all the way back to the founding. So what does it ultimately do to our country, this fraudulent I mean it sounds like we have a lot of assets that are in our control but there's a lot of assets that aren't and a lot of debt that is not so can you explain what this what the structure really looks like and who's in control of it well perhaps the best way to look at it is in terms of, of jurisdiction there are three basic jurisdictions air land and sea and we the unincorporated states and people control the land and soil of this country. So when you're talking about actual factual living breathing people and actual assets like trees and dirt, you're talking about the land and soil jurisdiction that is inherently ours, but which has not been properly maintained and controlled and operated by the American people for decades, okay? And then you have the international jurisdiction, which is the international jurisdiction of the sea. And if you think about this, you'll see how the, the sea laps up against the shores of all the different countries. And um, that is the jurisdiction of international business. And there are basically two kinds of, of international business that go on. There's international trade, and there's international commerce. Trade is um, business conducted between unincorporated entities or between unincorporated entities and corporations, such as a, a mom and pop business buying shoelaces from a corporation, right? Or it's business in commerce, which is by definition business between two incorporated entities. So like IBM buys something from GE, that's international commerce. Um, this country is a little bit strange and different in that respect in that every state is also a nation. So within the, um, the speaking the, the uh, verbiage that applies in America, everything that we do here is international. Interstate and international for us are synonymous because you've got 50 nation states that all connect to and interact with each other. Anyway, in the international jurisdiction, there are no people. There are only corporations, businesses, 
and officers of those businesses and corporations. It's all a matter of what we call legal fiction entities, named entities. So, but that, that, officers are relevant. Those yes, are people. They, right, they are, um, but they are operating in an office. Um, for example, a judge is an officer. Um, a uh, president is an officer. A queen is an officer. Uh, all of these entities, uh, GE, um, uh, any nation that you can name, France, uh, Britain, Canada, those are all legal fiction entities that all operate in the international jurisdiction. And so when they're operating in that capacity, they are a distinct thing apart from the land and soil of, say, Canada, or the actual living people. How are people, uh, you know, people talk about self-determination. How does that tie into this situation? Well, self-determination and self-governance are actually pretty much synonymous concepts. Um, it's the ability that we have as living, breathing, sentient beings to make decisions about how we live our lives and how we organize our civilizations, our, our business affairs and everything else. And unfortunately, we were sort of lulled to sleep or uh, enticed by wrong assumptions to stop functioning in self-governance. We were not aware of what was happening at the time, and we were not told. But gradually, our international trustees usurped upon our position and reduced us to acting as dependents, even though there's nothing that mandates that we act as dependents. As long as we act as dependents, then they assume control and they assume responsibility for us, and they tell us how to dance and how long and when to go to bed and when to wash behind our ears. Who are they? Uh, we have two international trustees. The British monarch is our trustee on the high seas and inland waterways, and the Pope is our trustee in global jurisdiction. So... Both the popes and the British monarchs have been largely responsible for the development of the problems that we are facing right now. Um, I think it's important that everybody understand that the federal government is separate from our government. We've been conditioned to think that the federal government is something uh, that is ours and, and is... Um, you know, the government. It's not. The federal government is under contract to provide services to our government. And it's always been that way. The constitutions that created the federal government created three different levels of federal government. The actual federal government, which was operated by the Confederation of States, that was created by the Articles of Confederation, the territorial government, which was meant to um, administer new territories while they were in transit between being a territory and an actual state, and also to take care of the territorial possessions like Puerto Rico and Guam, and finally the municipal United States, which was originally limited to the 10 miles square of the District of Columbia as a city government in, assess, in essence. So you have those three levels of federal government. They were established by three separate but very similar constitutions. Uh, in 1787, we have the Constitution for the United States of America. In 1789, we have the Constitution of the United States of America for the territories and territorial government. 
and in 1790 we have the Constitution of the United States, which is the municipal government. So we have three levels of federal government, and each one of those levels is supposed to be providing specific services in specific realms of endeavor, if you will. The original federal government, which was formed, uh, was under the auspices of the Confederation of States, which was formed in 1781 by the Articles of Confederation. Each one of the states, the actual states, had a doing business entity called the State of. So you had Georgia first, and then you had the State of Georgia, right? And this state of Georgia, this federal state of Georgia, um, as it were, after 1787, was always named with a capital T on the, and the was made part of the actual name so that the proper federal state was called the state of Georgia, and the was part of the name, and the was always capitalized. Anyway, so those states were mothballed in the wake of the Civil War. They were put under Reconstruction, and the Reconstruction was never completed. You can go to the Library of Congress or the National Archives, and you can ask about this, and you will find that the Reconstruction Acts that were put in place in 1866-67 um, are still in effect. Most of them have never been altered or repealed in any respect. Those federal states, those original federal states and their constitutions were mothballed. They were held in abeyance pending their reconstruction and the territorial United States, which was operated by the British government, came in and substituted itself for those original federal states. They did this in 1868, and uh, it, was, it was quite a con job. Uh, they used a lot of similar names, deceits, to pull it off, but they pulled it off. Well, as a result, um, we have had a, a progression of different foreign commercial companies in here providing us with governmental services. And they've been acting pretty much on their own terms. Uh, because nobody was minding the shop. Well, because, so are they in the crown in control of those companies, supposedly? And nobody, so for example, what kind of company are you talking about that maybe somebody would relate to? Well, um, let, let's start with the original fraud. Uh, in 1868, the Scottish government issued a charter for a new corporation, a commercial corporation, calling itself the United States of America. Okay? That corporation then issued what it called the Constitution, called the Constitution of the United States of America. And then they... So my, my whole thing that I'm having issue with is why can't we just clean it up, kick them out, and have our country? We can but we have to work together. Uh, Donald Trump and I and, and the others who are cognizant of, of what has gone on here have got to get together and go face them off and tell them, look, enough enough. We're not going to be responsible for all these odious debts that you've trumped up. No pun intended, Mr. Trump. I'm sorry. Just a misuse of the word. Um, we're we're not going to pay all these odious debts that we don't actually owe, and we are going to claim back our assets and all of the uh, credit that we are owed, and we are going to settle this out. This is not going to continue. Well, I would think we'd just be able to do it overnight and get rid of them. Now, how much power do they have over our country, and how do they maintain that power? Well, the key to this is the presidential office. Um, except for all of the alphabet soup agencies, which have managed to create sort of a life of their own. 
right now, President Trump is being somewhat hobbled by the bankruptcy and the need to deal with bankruptcy trustees. And that can be ended overnight. That's, that's a no-brainer. Uh, the more difficult problem is dealing with the trustees and convincing them that the jig is up, which means the queen and the pope. Now, I believe the Pope is fully cognizant, and, you know, my interactions with them uh, indicate that, yes, they truly do know that this has to end, and they're committed to bringing it to a peaceful conclusion. How do you know that? How do you know that? You've ca- talked to, had interaction with the Pope, and they know that? Yes, they know that. They absolutely do know that, and they have taken action to reform. How do you know? That? I mean, queen, do you have documents or what do you have that shows that, that they know that they need to do this? Well, it's gone to the Vatican Chance Report. It's been reviewed at The Hague. It has, there are tens of thousands of notices that have been sent out. Uh, Pope Benedict asked for help to give notice to his airing employees worldwide, and that has been done. Um, since his since he ascended to the pulpit office, uh, Pope Francis has um, done numerous moto proprios and, and and actions that have served to correct uh, operations of various entities throughout the world and to uh, expose the wrongdoers to prosecution. Actually, a lot has been done by the. Uh, by the church to clean up its act. Okay. They dissolved the uh, office of the pontiff and the pontificate in 2011. And uh, for the most part, they are making a credible effort to uh, make things right. The queen did nothing of the sort throughout Mr. Obama's administration And it's only been since Donald Trump came into office that she's made an effort to pay some of her own bills and to take responsibility for the um, wrongdoing of her employees on our shores. Most specifically, the members of the Bar Association, uh, which is not really, it's not entirely her responsibility. Some of it is the responsibility of Westminster, the Lord Mayor, We have a, we, the United States of America, unincorporated, have a treaty that goes back to November of 1794, promising us basically eternal peace and amity um, amity from the government of Westminster. And that has been widely violated. So we have just recently been taking them to task for the misbehavior of their employees on our shores. So who is but, we? Who is we that, is, that are taking them to task? The United States of America Unincorporated has the authority to exercise that treaty and to enforce the law. Okay. Who, and who specifically is doing that movement? My husband and I and all of the people that work with us are doing this because we're qualified to act in that capacity. And we became qualified to act in that capacity through a very long legal process and struggle that we've gone through for the last 20 some years. Uh, It doesn't happen overnight, but you do have the option. And if you're determined and if you're knowledgeable, you can reclaim your standing. Now, part of what I've been doing and what my team has been doing has been to help other Americans regain their capacity and their standing so that there are people on all 50 states now who have the capacity to um, come forward in the name of the United States of America unincorporated and enforce these treaties and make these people start behaving as they should according to their own agreements, both treaties and commercial contracts. In what ways have they violated those original treaties? They've basically redefined us as being people that are not owed those treaties. 
and then they have prosecuted and persecuted accordingly. Um, so, for part, example? Well, for example, people in the territorial United States and Puerto Rico and Guam and American Samoa have never had um, constitutional rights or guarantees. They've always been outside of the constitutional network, if you will. Now, I don't agree with that. I don't like that. But that's the way it's been, because they were under the thumb and forefinger of the British king. The British monarch uh, was left in charge of operating the territorial United States government as a trustee. And so they never had any constitutional guarantees. That's why when you go into a U.S. district court and start talking about the Constitution and your constitutional guarantees and your Bill of Rights, they look at you and they say, I'm going to hold you in contempt of court if you say another word about the Constitution. They're right because they are viewing you as a territorial citizen, okay? And territorial citizens have never had any recourse to the Constitution. How many people actually understand this and actually enforce it at a high level? Uh, unfortunately, not a lot. Uh, I would say we now have somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200 people that actually truly do understand the, um, the fraud and the conundrum and the semantic deceit uh, to the extent that they can actually enforce against them. But that not growing. Well, how many people on the other side that are perpetrating the fraud and the deceit are knowingly doing that? Ironically, probably not that many more than, than on our side of the issues. Um, I really, truly believe that 90% of those who are involved, probably 95% of those involved in enforcing the fraud and deceit, are unaware. They, they just do it blindly? They do. Well, this system is highly compartmentalized. You only know what you need to know about your particular function. So you can be sitting there at your desk, at your computer terminal, entering information on a computer screen and think nothing about it. I mean, your job is to enter it on the computer screen. Da-da, you do it. Where it goes from there or who uses it for what purposes, you don't know. So you're innocent, but you're contributing to the fraud and you're contributing to the evil that ultimately results, unaware of what your work is serving. So the people that are perpetrating this fraud that do are aware, are they doing it knowingly and forcefully to make sure they can keep the system going? Absolutely. And they're doing it for their economic self-interest. This is about enslaving people and assets and palming off debts and all sorts of commercial crimes. These are commercial crimes. They have nothing to do with politics. It's nothing ever to do with politics. And what kind of commercial crimes? Can you give an example? Are we talking child trafficking? Yes, human trafficking. In a very real way, we've all been trafficked. Every American who has a birth certificate has been trafficked into a foreign jurisdiction and left there, abandoned, unable to get back to their natural political status, unless they wake up, realize what's been done to them, and then work out step by step the means to get back on the land jurisdiction that they are heir to. What a jurisdiction so, yes. is everybody in right now? As of 1933, they've all been dumped in the international jurisdiction of the sea and redefined as corporate entities, as franchises of a bankrupt corporation that was run by the Roman Catholic Church. Well, with the Pope trying to change that, would part of that fixing their act put us all back to where we should be? Well, the odd thing is, is that they can't do it. We have to do it. Some of us had to regain our standing and then enter into the offices and operate the United States of America unincorporated to do that. And that's what we've done. 
What we have done is we've seized upon all of the assets of the municipal United States, all of the assets of the territorial United States, all of the assets that were mothballed in the federal state of state trusts, and we've rolled all of that back into the jurisdiction and possession of the actual states of the Union, which are the sovereign states on the land and soil. In doing that, we have prevented any secondary creditors from making any claims against us. And we've also put an end to a lot of the, the foo-foo-ra with the European uh, U.S. bankruptcy trustees coming in here and causing trouble. Do they acknowledge you? Does the Queen and the Pope acknowledge what you've done? Yes, they do. Uh, however, here's the deal. Corporations yes. are dead entities. They are legal fictions. They have no operating power in and of themselves. So it takes living people to operate these things, just like it takes someone to operate a car or a machine or sail a boat. So what had happened is that our quote-unquote flagship, our ship of state, had been mothballed and not operating for, well, say the 1960s, the mid-1960s. Um, so when we reappeared, occupied our flagship, and took off, there was nobody to say any different about it. Do you, do you see what I mean? Our ship of state in international jurisdiction was dry docked. It was not operating. It wasn't there. And the, the, the trustees simply took over and did whatever they liked. So essentially, the Pope and the Queen have been controlling this country. Yes. Now, does the president actually take directions from the Queen, or is it indirectly and they don't even realize it? That I couldn't tell you. That's a question for Donald Trump. I get the feeling that as time has gone by and the education effort has has developed, that he is understanding more and more about the actual functioning of the government as it was meant to function and as it has in fact functioned and uh, the different roles of the individuals. I've been told that he had the entire National Archives uh, searched by teams of expert lawyers who then confirmed for him that what I'm telling you and what I told him and what I've told everybody is true. Did you and talk it, to him directly? Have you had an opportunity to talk to him directly? I have talked to him via different channels, different people who have access to him and um, different functions. Uh, I think that initially they thought we were crackpots. I think that they have since learned differently. And I think that we are coming closer and closer to a point when uh, they realize that they're shadow boxing with themselves and that we are not the enemy and that we're not some group of subversives and that we're simply uh, shedding light on aspects of the history that have been ignored, misunderstood, and profited upon by rather sleazy characters that took advantage of the situation. Now, how so, can people, the best way for people to learn for themselves that you're not a crackpot? You know what I'm saying? Because the narrative that you're telling us is so different than what we grew up with. So how do we educate ourselves and go, educate ourselves on whether you're a crackpot or not? And I don't mean to be disrespectful. I just, no, no. you know. Well, I think that um, one of the, the, the really jolting ways that I myself woke up was from taking a look at what should be there that isn't. One of the lies we've been told is that the Articles of Confederation were um, replaced by the Constitution. You know, I'm sure you were told that when you were mm -hmm. in school, right? Yeah. Well, where is there any action repealing these supposedly perpetual articles of confederation? If those articles were overcome or subsumed or replaced by the Constitution, then logically the Congress at some point had to take action to set those articles aside. 
But there is no such action. They were never set aside. They're perpetual. So they state that they're perpetual. So how do you how do you come up with this conclusion that the constitutions replaced them? They didn't. And in fact, if you look, you will find that the Articles of Confederation were in full force and effect up until 1860, at which point the South seceded from the Confederation. And what did they do? They formed their own Confederation of States, the Confederate States of America. You see how the name carries through? We had the Articles of Confederation. We had the Confederation of Federal States of States that were operating the federal government originally. And then we had the Confederate States of America. Do people think this is just a coincidence? No. And there is no action by Congress repealing, changing, or altering the Articles of Confederation. So right there, that should be present, and it's not. Another thing that you will, you can look for very easily that should be there and isn't is a declaration of war from the Congress uh, beginning the Civil War. No such declaration exists. There is a pseudo-declaration from President Lincoln ordering the attack in South Carolina that touched off the fighting. But there is no actual declaration of any kind of war associated with the Civil War by the Congress. So there was no Civil War. What we had was an illegal commercial fight, a mercenary conflict on our shores. All right, so there should be a declaration of war for the American Civil War, and there isn't. Also, if you look for a peace treaty ending the American Civil War, there is none. Nothing. What happened at Appomattox was not a peace treaty. It was a, um, a surrender of an army, of Lee's army, but it was not a peace treaty. There is no peace process related to the Civil War extant. You can look from here to next New Year and you will never find it. I've looked for 40 years and so have many other people. and Nobody can find anything like that. So it should be there, but it isn't. Well, when they succeeded, what happened to get them back? What was the, was there any documentation for that? What do you mean? The <laughs> South succeeded and created the Confederation of States. Right. Okay. Is that, we still in that kind of scenario? Yes. The federal states have been held in abeyance since 1868. They've been, all of the, all of the assets and all of the controls and everything that were supposed to be handled by our own federal states of states were mothballed and put into what are called land trusts. And these land trusts uh, are sort of duplicitously named too because they're land in the sense that they belong to the land jurisdiction states, not that they are actual trusts of land. Okay. This is this is really confusing, especially for somebody who just doesn't, you know, somebody who really is grew up in, in a different paradigm, which is all of us. Where can they find more information and start to do uh, their own research? What would you say is the best way for a person to do that? And then what is the best way for Trump and his administration to do that? Well, we provided kind of a primer, like a sixth grade level primer, with our book, which is uh, called You Know Something is Wrong When, An American Affidavit of Probable Cause. And in that book, we just basically take a um, very simple, kind of uh, almost childish look at what went on here and we retrace the fraud and all the pivot points to it. So if you read that as a basic primer, you'll pick up some of the citations right there and you'll see the progression of it up to the current day. At the back of that book is the actual affidavit, which is testimony in the form of an affidavit. It's an enumerated complaint to 
of wrongs, basically, that um, we issued in 2015 against the perpetrators and those responsible. Now, I say perpetrators and those responsible because there are those that actually knew and then there are those who are responsible who are supposed to be taking action to prevent this sort of thing who are not. And so um, you'll see the entire enumerated uh, claim uh, in that book. And at the very back, you'll see an appendix. And the appendix contains numerous different um, documents and um, information that is useful for people to begin their own contemplation and their own action to pull their own fat out of the fire. Now, throughout all of this, you know, my husband and I and the others associated with us could have been acting just for ourselves, and we could have just gotten our own standing and, and released our own estate and gotten all sorts of money for ourselves, but we didn't do that. What we did was we brought along everyone else, and we protected all of their property, too. So, essentially, uh, as a result of, of all this work over all these years, uh, what we just did is we rolled all of the assets of the governments, the federal governments, under the state governments, the actual state governments, not the state of state governments. And that brings all of the assets back under the land and soil jurisdictions and protects them from seizure. Now, this also requires a change in presumption in the courts. There's been a lot of talk about the gold fringe flags and, and all this other stuff that, you know, why are the courts so off base? Well, they've been operating in two different jurisdictions that have nothing to do with us, actually. And they've been operating under false presumptions with regard to us. When we did this, what we, do, what we did is basically a lawful conversion to correct the unlawful conversion that FDR pulled off in the 1930s. He put everybody out at sea and mischaracterized us as corporate franchises of his own bankrupt corporation, whereas what we have done is to reverse that and bring everybody back onto the land where the presumption has to be that we are acting as living people and not as corporate franchisees. So you're going to see all that uh, gold fringe disappearing from the courtrooms, and you're going to see the courts reverting back to uh, operating under different presumptions, which is a, a great thing just in and of itself. You're also going to see a much stronger basis for people to fight foreclosure actions and other kinds of, um, you know, actions that are aimed at um, controlling and abusing our Bill of Rights, for example, we'll be able to exercise that. Does that go far into the banks having almost unlimited power? The banks are not going to have unlimited power. Well, they yeah. do. It seems like they do now. And is that part of how it's set up? Well, yeah, the banks were, were the ones in back of all of this. The banks were the ones that engineered this as the middlemen. Uh, you know, they, they bear a very large share of the blame for this. But they are corporations like other corporations, and corporations cannot stand against living men. But they can stand against us that are turned into franchi franchisees, that's, and that's why they did it? Right. Exactly. Now... Did FDR understand that he was doing that to every human in America? He understood. Yes, he did. And they were doing it on purpose to get unlimited power over the people. Well, and more importantly, from their standpoint, to force us to pay for their corporation's debts. See, they could rack up almost unlimited debt against us and our assets 
and then leave us standing there holding the bag to pay their debts for them. Okay. Well, I appreciate you so much joining the program. I think the next step is for people to to go out there and start to learn so they actually have meaningful questions. What is your website and where can people go to get your books? Uh, the books are available from Amazon.com. Um, basically, they, there are three of them. There's Disclosure 101, which is kind of explains the history of how I got involved in this. Uh, I, I had a background that was totally different than anything to do with this, um, but it explains the history of that and then how I got involved in the correction with the, the church, um, how we went to Rome and complained, <laughs> and, and, you know, all of that, and then the, um, the notice process, giving due notice to the, uh, to the Pope's employees and to people throughout the world. We've got tens of thousands of uh, notice actions and due process actions and, and hundreds of court actions that are in place that were started in 1998 and continued through. And then 2008 was another big push. Um, so Disclosure 101 gives that history, okay? It also gives 11 pages of citations and references, um, key bits of legislation and uh, key references in the congressional record and, you know, things of that sort that form kind of a basic basis to understand who did what, when, and how it worked together. And then we have the, um, the, the comic book, I call it. We... Uh, we were despairing. How could we explain this to Joe Average, right? This is stuff that took us 40 years to become aware of and track down. So we needed kind of a basic primer. And at the same time, coincidentally, we needed to publish our, um, our testimony against the rats. And so we kind of killed two birds with one stone and created a comic book-like um, presentation that's very easy for people to read. It's large print, lots of illustrations and cartoons that step-by-step uh, step take you through it. And then there's the affidavit in the back of the book. And then there is the, um, the, uh, the very useful appendix of documents that sort of demonstrate for people. And finally, I did an abstract for President Trump, which is, it has only one new citation in it, but it's meant to be kind of a businessman's cliff notes to the entire thing. And it's written in a style that is um, like a soundbite style. If you can read soundbites and keep adding those little pieces together, as most business people can, you can get this all down, in essence, in about an hour and a half, two hours. And that one is called America, Some Assembly Required. Well, excellent. Would you stay after for my patrons for five minutes and give them a, a few more tidbits of information? Sure. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome.